So up next, um, we're going to talk about data and, and content and how data can unlock the power of content. I'd like to introduce to the stage uh, Wenda Harris Millard. Wenda is an industry veteran of 20 plus years, having worked at Yahoo and DoubleClick and various publishing houses before that. Wenda is the president and COO of MediaLink. Wenda. Well, good morning, everyone, yeah, and thank you for joining us uh, for the content and data in the driver's seat. Uh, program this morning. I'm delighted to have Jim Norton with me. Uh, he is the global head of media sales for AOL and as such is responsible for cross-platform marketing solutions and advertising sales uh, for the entire AOL brand portfolio, uh, which includes, among others, the Huffington Post and Gadget, Stylist, AOL Platforms, AOL On, uh, and MapQuest, of course. So, Jim, welcome, welcome. Well, good morning. Good morning, good morning. So why don't we start uh, with you with an update on one of the, the most important announcements, I think, of 2015, and that was Verizon's acquisition of AOL. So uh, given this new uh, sort of operating paradigm for mm -hmm. both companies, how has your uh, corporate vision at, at AOL uh, evolved? Yeah, so um, that acquisition is just approaching one year. It'll be one year next month. Uh, That's right, it was actually, announced at Cannes, it was a, Yeah, it, it closed at Cannes. It, it, was, announced, at Cannes. Uh, yeah, it was announced a couple months uh, prior to that. So, you know, kind of looking back really over the last year and, and how we've evolved and how we've kind of approached our own corporate strategy is really in two ways. One, it is um, focus on mobile and Verizon being the largest wireless carrier uh, in the U.S. Uh, only makes sense for mobile to be at the core of how we're thinking about the future. And then secondly, I would say the uh, impact of data and what you can ascertain from uh, handset data, so mobile device data. And clearly with Verizon and well over 100 million users, uh, there is a richness of data that we are now exploring and we've got a number of beta tests out on being able to determine uh, at a very high level uh, both users, user habits, and also uh, what, what is the right content for those users to consume both branded content as well as consumer content. So w with that combination, you, you have what, what I would call, uh, I don't think too, uh, too much of an exaggeration, an unprecedented mm. uh, opportunity uh, to measure uh, the impact of this combination of, of content plus, plus data. Yeah. Is that a fair statement? I, yo, oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I think you know, it, is, it is in our heritage, right, to use data to drive content, uh, and AOL's been doing it for a long time. I'll, I'll call out Huffington Post mm -hmm. specifically, right. you know, so Huffington Post, just a 10-year anniversary, and they really pioneered content optimization through data, and the way in which, in real time, content was adjusted, uh, how editors were thinking about producing content, not only producing, but also optimizing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it is in our heritage to use data uh, for delivering content, but I would say the, really the next generation of that is the highly deterministic uh, access that we have to data on, you know, on user habits and how we are now applying Verizon data to our own content development, and then in, in turn, how are we taking that user data to do a much better job in serving relevant ads in the right format at the right time? So it's really, you know, in many ways, I think it, it's not necessarily just the data, it's the derivative of the data, it's, it's the consumer insight um, that you can provide to, uh, to marketers about, mm -hmm. about their consumers. How do you, how are you going about measuring uh, the impact of, of this exciting combination of the content and the yeah, data. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say it's two things. Obviously, you know, we're very conscious of, you know, how is, how is the content that we're producing being consumed? But secondly, I think, and, and this is really one of the bigger challenges in the industry, is that, you know, as we have seen this very, very rapid shift from desktop to mobile device, um, and also from text and image-based content to video-based content, and then video on the mobile device, 
Uh, it presents a whole host of new challenges. And I would say, you know, where we're, where we're thinking about it is, you know, how do we continue to evolve our video content? Um, and then what's the right way in which to serve, in, to serve advertising against that? So, you know, moving from what was, you know, hey, how do we repurpose a 15 or 30 second television spot uh, and, and just use that as a pre-roll, post-roll application to now, you know, what are the more innovative ways in which we can deliver a branded message against premium content? So since, since the acquisition uh, by Verizon, AOL has continued to be acquisitive. Mm. You bought uh, Millennial Media yep. in the mobile space. Uh, you bought Riot mm -hmm. uh, in VR, uh, as well as a number of small data companies. Um, as you continue to seek new, new partnerships, can you talk about uh, some of your, your ambitions here? Yeah, well, I think, you know, th there's a couple things. Um, and, and this has been mentioned in a number of the previous presentations is, you know, we've seen this pendulum swing um, where, you know, 18, the last 18, 24 months, programmatic ad technology, and we've certainly done our part in terms of both acquisition as well as just organic development of our, our own ad stack with the launch of one by AOL uh, a couple of years ago. But you know, now we're seeing the pendulum swing as well back much more towards content. And you know, so one of the things uh, probably, uh, you know, in, in our opinion, equally as large as the Verizon acquisition of AOL, it's our partnership with Microsoft. And, and AOL uh, essentially running Microsoft's advertising business. And, and that started uh, after the That the was after, yeah, so. that was, so it was in discussion prior to the Verizon acquisition, but really that was July 1st of last year. So brands like MSN and Xbox, as well as Skype and Outlook, and th that as part of our portfolio. So we think of MSN and Xbox as very rich and uh, rich creative, uh, platforms on which we can continue to tell brand stories. So, um, you know, that has ve been very core to, you know, what we've done um, really in the last in the, uh, one year ago. But I would say, you know, you mentioned Riot uh, as an acquisition we recently made, which is a virtual reality and 360 production company. And they are, they are straight up VR producers. And we've got that uh, acquisition aligned specifically with Huffington Post because the data was telling us that Huffington Post users were more apt to, v to view the content, consume the Huffington Post content by way of video, and then the next generation of that is in some sort of either 360 or virtual reality context. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's an acquisition that closed less than one month ago, but we really feel like that the next generation of content consumption is certainly in either a VR or an AR or even 360 uh, format. So if nothing else, you could write a book on integration. <laughs> yeah, well, that's certainly... That's you a know, lot in one year. It has been, yeah, it's been <laughs> aggressive, uh, you know, but I would say, you know, it's, it's it, the industry has been aggressive too, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, sure. you know, one of the things that we've seen is yeah, the transactional media buying. So if you're just dealing with standard ad units in either, either a, a text image based environment or even a video environment, uh, that has just all more or less shifted uh, programmatically, right? If, if it's standard and transactional, you should be doing it programmatically. And we're certainly the beneficiary of those industry trends. But, you know, as that pendulum has swung back, it's really the need for, for content and especially mobile content. And millennial media, the acquisition that we made last fall, um, 75,000 apps through the um, millennial media SDK. And so, you know, that gives us access to over 800 million uh, unique devices. Uh, so, you know, instant scale um, and very high quality in-app content. And I think that's, you know, another one of the big industry trends that's been difficult to follow is mobile web being a sort of a very similar cookie-based desktop environment. Uh, but the shift to in-app consumption of content is much different. And you've got to take a very different approach, not only to the way in which you measure that, but also the way in which you create for in-app um, consumption. So could you replicate the data opportunities you have now uh, via Verizon? Could mm -hmm. you replicate that with international carriers? Yeah, we think so. Uh, you know, I mean, we, you, know, you mentioned it, the really unique and what we believe is to be um, a very differentiated approach to data 
you know, the very rich carrier data that we're getting through Verizon. And, you know, really the way in which the genesis of the AOL acquisition by Verizon was Verizon had traditionally used their handset data to think of ways in which to drive usage and, and drive data plans. So how do you go from a 10 gig to a 50 gig plan uh, per month? But they quickly realized that they're sitting on what, you know, the metaphor we use is, you know, you're, you're sitting on really this oil well of raw data that needs to be extracted from the ground, refined, and, and then monetized. Well, again, it's the insight, it's the derivative of that. Yeah, of that data. And, and, and so, you know, very quickly, and, and, you know, and certainly as the wireless industry, especially in the U.S., has really not, you know, reached a point of diminishing returns where mm -hmm. it's very much a share game now, uh, where mobile penetration has reached a point where, you know, growth is flatlining. So the need for Verizon to find an alternative revenue source and saying, hey, we have this unique data asset, how can we monetize that? And so by acquiring AOL, AOL essentially becomes the rig to extract that data oil, refine it, monetize it. And we've been approached by many international carriers who are watching this very closely because they too have this oil well right. Right. of raw data. And so uh, where Verizon is predominantly US based from a carrier standpoint, you know, how do we work with carriers in Europe or South America or other emerging markets and strike a data partnership where we essentially do monetization on their behalf. Mm -hmm. And we've really spent the last year uh, thinking very carefully because you know, the, the personalized nature of handset data uh, and, and, you know, and certainly Verizon and the regulatory uh, impact of, of working within those data sets is very unique. Um, and so, you know, how can we take those learnings, take the security, take the integrity of working with data like that and potentially apply it mm -hmm. to other partners? So it's, it's actually very exciting because we believe and we know there's a thirst for this just based on purely the inbound that we're getting from other major carriers internationally to say, hey, you know, can we could, talk could about we a partnership? Yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, so, Jim, I, I know that you can't comment on the... Uh, potential acquisition of Yahoo yep. uh, by Verizon AOL. Um, but could you comment on the potential <laughs> acquisition of Yahoo by Verizon I'm, AOL? I'm, I'm, su <laughs> I'm surprised you waited until the eighth question <laughs> to, uh, to ask that. Look, you know, we've been public, and uh, both Tim Armstrong um, and, uh, and, and the Verizon leadership team yeah. have been outspoken about our, you know, our interest in exploring the Yahoo opportunity. Um, it is still early stages, um, and you know we have, and you know, we, as we've said publicly, we have had discussions with them. It's too early to comment on where we think that will end up. One of the things we don't know is is really who else is in the mix. We we sort of know mm -hmm. based on reading the press of who else is in the mix. But what I will say about Yahoo, but more broadly, is Verizon's commitment to investing in this business and investing in media, investing in content, investing in data. And we're, we're really thinking about uh, the AOL slash Verizon strategy against four pillars. That's, that's mobile, that's video, that's data, and then really an open mindset and an open platform of working with partners, whether it partners by way of acquisition, uh, by way of partnership or joint venture, um, and we encourage, whether it's content creators, data providers, brands, agencies, publishers, to work with us in this open environment. Um, you know, if Yahoo presents itself as a good content opportunity or a good data opportunity, um, you know, that's something that we are certainly looking at. Well, thanks for not blowing off that question entirely. Yeah. I appreciate <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you uh, one more question before we bring uh, Richard Hartel up uh, to the stage with us. What some of the new, from, from a, a content, particularly video yeah. standpoint, uh, what are some of the, the plans that you have uh, in support of launching uh, maybe some, some original content? I know you do a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, the world is moving to video. You yeah. know, we, we've seen it. We know it. It's happening. Um, so what, what's going on uh, well, uh, you know, with it's, your it's, originals? It's a, good, it's a good question. Just coming off of the recent New Front season, that, uh, it's the digital content New Front in the U.S., that precedes the traditional television upfront, which was just taking place, uh, it's taking place now, this week, yeah. yeah. Um, so 
The approach that we took this year in terms of our video, our original programming slate, was in years past we would develop a slate working in large, largely with independent producers, and it was a slate of originals that we would green light based on, you know, based on one, based on data, based on gut. Um, and the approach that we took this year was to have each of our brands, so if we think about brands like Huffington Post or uh, TechCrunch and Gadget, uh, have those brands develop their own individual slate of original programming. So Autoblog, which is our automo an endemic automotive site, then Autoblog to say, hey, these are the three original programmings that we know our, our users, the, the Autoblog consumers, are interested in based on the user data that Autoblog has. And so developing a slate of programming now that not only is rooted in data, but also is a transition from a text and image based content delivery to a video centric delivery of content. Um, and, and now Autoblog has the opportunity in, 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 to also promote that. So the ability to drive traffic directly against those original programs. One of the challenges with uh, original digital video has always been distribution and traffic. And it was like, you know, how, how do you find that? Now, if you think about, you know, if it's TechCruncher and Gadget or Huffington Post, the ability, there's a very high vested interest in them using their space to drive traffic and, uh, and audience development, if you will, to that, that original programming. So it's a different approach and, and one that we think is, is the way in which all, everybody should be thinking about how do you produce original video content. And, and that being said, I mean, certainly um, the other big development, you know, off of the AOL network and much more towards Verizon is the recent launch of Go90, which yeah. is a millennial-based, uh, mobile-based, uh, application, it's, it's over the top, uh, it is 100% video, focused on the millennial audience, and what's exciting about you know, Verizon being behind that is their ability to go out and strike major, major content development deals. So it's licensing from the NFL, NBA, IndyCar, um, co comedy and lifestyle with, with, through Funny or Die, and we're working with all of the major Hollywood studios who have projects going that they're looking for distribution. Oh, distribution. And so, you know, Go90, which is in, uh, in uh, still early phases, we expect a major launch and, and relaunch this summer, but what's most important there is the level of premium content that, uh, that will be running through Go90. So stay tuned for more on that. Great. Well, I would like uh, to invite Richard Hartel uh, to join Jim and me in this conversation and offer his thoughts through, uh, through the agency lens. Richard is the global head of, uh, uh, global president of strategy and transformation for Publicis Group. Um, and your charge there, uh, Richard, is leading uh, Publicis Media's strategic uh, approach globally by transforming uh, how the agency's clients think about uh, the evolution of consumers' relationships with, with brands. I hope I have that right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. well, great. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, welcome. Um, thank, thank you for you. joining, joining the like conversation. Feels like being a media agency person again. <laughs> yeah, there I've been you the go. last five minutes of the presentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Kind of, <laughs> last just like that, the old days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, um, lots and lots of changes uh, in the media landscape, you know, notwithstanding. Uh, the barriers that once separated the agency uh, definition seem to be, uh, if, if not broken, at least blurred. Um, yeah. And creative shops are winning business that normally uh, would be considered media assignments and media agencies are handling uh, content creations. Looks like a lot, of, a lot of jump ball to me. So what, what are the implications here um, for, for all of us in, in the business, not, not just for agencies? Yeah, look, I mean, I think um, the separation of media agencies and creative agencies that happened you know, 20, 30 years ago is something which um, is absolutely has to be reversed. It has to be reversed, but in a, a different way. So we are in the process as an industry uh, and definitely a publicist uh, group of breaking down those silos, and they completely have to be broken down once again. And it's kind of, it means and, and it requires a completely new level of interdependency between people. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that interdependency uh, exists across everything. So if you imagine kind of, you know, the challenge of producing a piece of content for this, 
the level of interdependency that's required to do that is completely different to producing a television app. So, you know, content, data, interdependency with vendor community, interdependency with client data, um, CRM backend, the whole piece means you've got to work completely differently. So the silos have to come down uh, and the way that we work with different agencies has to change. And that inevitably will cause blur on what the capabilities are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got to create clear lines of where your skill set really is and then find the points of integration as well. Sort of te technology has, has changed our world in, in ways that sometimes we don't think, but uh, in terms of an infrastructure, uh, organizational structure uh, standpoint, I, I think we've really seen that uh, that separation between creative and, and media uh, is, a, is a false separation, g given that codependency, interdependency, um, Need, need for, for collaboration. Uh, Jim and I talked uh, a, a second ago about uh, data-driven creative, and yeah. uh, Jim mentioned that AOL has been at this for a long time, Proofpoint, uh, Huffington Post, uh, among others. Is, is data-driven creative an oxymoron um, to you? Is it, is it a chicken and egg situation? Or where, where do you come out on that? Yeah, well, data-driven content might be an oxymoron, but... Um there's actually, there's a, there's a, there was a survey done in America amongst uh, people of what they wanted to see in a piece of art, what they loved in a piece of art. Mm -hmm. So they loved, everyone loves a landscape. So 88% of people said they loved a landscape. Everyone loves a sunset or a sunrise. So that's, you know, that's in a painting. Everyone loves a frolicking deer or, you know, <laughs> and everyone apparently loves a picture of George Washington in this painting. <laughs> so they basically took all this data and created the perfect painting. And guess what? It's a terrible painting. <laughs> right? So if you just have the data to inform the content, then you end up with pretty poor content. So you need a creative leap. So data-driven content, yeah, might be an oxymoron. Data-inspired content, absolutely, mm. absolutely. So again, if you think about um, how Netflix made House of Cards, so they've realized that David Fincher series, you know, people binge watch David Fincher series. They realized that Kevin Spacey was a fantastic draw. Um, they realized that House of Cards was a great piece of, uh, great piece of content. Put all those things together and you could have ended up with something terrible still. But that creativity led to something that was fantastic. So, Except you know, the British version is still better. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. <laughs> but, but then in many cases that is the case. So. <laughs> So good. Um, you know, this all uh, sort of sort of leads uh, to both of you to to a question about given these sort of sets of, of, of transformation, are there differences now in in the way that, for example, Jim media companies are are working with agencies, mm -hmm. uh, working with your other partners, working working with your clients. What does that mean to the relationship uh, between and among all, all the players? Do you see a change, Jim? Yeah, well, I mean, I, one of the things, and, and you know, I, I really applaud what Publis is doing in terms of breaking down the barriers mm -hmm. of, between creative and media. And if you think about, you know, us as a, um, really as a vendor, and we're working just with a media team who does not have access to the creative, and we're telling the media team hey, you know, based on what we're seeing within the campaign, we think that variations in the creative could you know, improve performance. Um, if, that, if, if the media team does not have access to either multiple formats of the creative or they've got to go to another constituent in order to get that done, you know, they, they, there's a, a lot less flexibility there. And, you know, and especially as well, you know, the, having a single set of creative is just not sufficient any longer. And really what we sure. like to say is, hey, how do we take all of the creative assets and let us help assemble those in real time, um, it, which you know, sort of you know, helps us remove the friction between you know, the classic media agency, mm -hmm. creative agency. So uh, you know, it, you know, it, it's, it's something that we're coaching clients on quite a bit. Do you see that same level of, of collaboration, Richard, with media partners, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the thing is, is the, the economics of content have completely changed. So, you know, 
in the in the past you needed very few content assets. Now you need a multiplicity of content assets. So and th and that might come from different sources. So that might come from an advertising agency. It might come from a vendor. It might come from a production company. It might come from consumers. It can come from many many different places. But the kind of key thing is is still how you knit all that together. Mm -hmm. And you know the people often talk about. Um, the death of advertising agencies. It's kind of a ridiculous thing. It's, the, it's sort of it's, the same thing as the death of you know, television. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You know, these things don't go away. And they're still incredibly, they create a brand vision that is still required to knit many, many different pieces of content together and to create a narrative that makes them work. So um, someone still needs to do that. And, and you're glue in that sense. And you're glue. Mm -hmm. And they might not be the executor of all of that content, mm -hmm. but you need an architect, and that often is not just the advertising agency, it's a collective to do that, um, but certainly in the production of that content, it can now come from many, many different sources, and that requires great collaboration. Mm -hmm. So would you ever consider dropping the word vendor in Who? terms of Them or media partners? Yeah, it, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, I know partners are an overused word, but... It is a bit, um, yeah. You know, it, it, it sounds to me like there's a lot more collaboration and, and literal partnership uh, among all, all the players. Yeah, I mean, I'm, to be honest, I've been in America for five years and I never heard the word vendor until I came to America. Ah, it was kind of a media owner or a media partner. It was never a media vendor. So, Jim, we need to change that. Yeah, I've I never liked that, that word. Let's change it right now. Yeah. You know, that I used to be called Wenda the Vendor. That used to drive me crazy, but um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, Jim, I, I want to talk for just a second about the, the launch of um, One TV mm -hmm. um, by AOL. And how, how does that, can you tell us first of all what that is? Yeah. Um, and how does that sort of enable linear providers, uh, if you will, to, to deliver experiences that really are um, cross screen? Yeah, I, I, so certainly there's been a lot of talk over the last several years about programmatic ad technology in the purely digital sense. But you know, how can you take the efficiency uh, of the transaction and apply it in a linear sense, specifically with, with TV? So you know, we launched um, a year ago One TV, where we are working on a limited basis today, but working mostly with um, uh, cable providers. Uh, and our, our original test was in Australia with MCN and you know, essentially taking their unsold uh, inventory. inventory. So as many of you know, the cable provider uh, has a certain amount of inventory that's afforded to them through their, um, their carrier rights, and then and put that into a programmatic marketplace and allow media, both brands and agencies, to transact against uh, TV. What we see is the addressability at the household level, so taking mm -hmm. cable set-top box data and applying that to the media buy, uh, but also applying it to the creative, and understanding and being able to make inferences about the makeup of that household and what is actually not only the ad or product to be delivered, but also the creative. And so, you know, we've, we, we're testing this in the, in the States as well right now. We think there's a huge opportunity there just because as we see standard media move, standard transactional media move to a programmatic platform, there's no reason why TV can't, be, can't, can't do, do the, the same. same. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Um, Richard, your, your uh, new role, very, very interesting one uh, from a, a transformation standpoint, how, how are you approaching the process of getting um, your brand teams to think and interact um, so that it inspires a, a sort of new and different way uh, of um, improving your client's business, you know, yeah. bringing it right back to yeah. who you're in, in business for. Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how are you approaching this? <clears throat> well, it's kind of, as Steve, was, Steve King was saying earlier, it's, um, it's how we're restructuring our business around clients. So that's where it's, we're absolutely mm -hmm. um, um, focusing on a client's need. So if you just approach a client from a media point of view as a media agency, or you just approach a client from an advertising point of view as one of the advertising agencies, or a technology point of view from one, one of the technology companies, you always solve the problem that you are good at solving, as opposed to probably what the real problem is. So my role um, 
is to connect strategically across publicist group. Um, the best strategic thing is you can help solve a client's business problem. So that might bring together a team of someone who's the CSO of Saatchi and Saatchi, someone who's a technologist from Sapient, and uh, a media specialist, and maybe some open source people as well in that process, to go, actually, the real problem you're trying to solve is this. The real way that you are going to unlock growth by re-engineering your customer experience is this. And when you get that team together, they do not have a biased point of view about what the solution might be. So it, it really gets back to the interdependency Absolutely, yeah. um, that, that we were talking about yeah, before. Um, we, just, we just have a very, very short uh, time left, but I think we'd be remiss if we uh, left the stage uh, without just a comment about talent and what all of this transformation really means in terms of where we're sourcing talent, uh, what we're expecting of people. Do we have to go to uh, different pools now of, of talent resource? Yeah. What, what does it mean uh, from an agency standpoint and then, Jim, from, from a company like AOL, for a company like AOL? So um, the whole theme of this is around data and content. Mm -hmm. And um, so data people are often very left brain and uh, content driven people, creative people are often very right brain. And if you do not get someone who can connect those two sets of people, they do not talk the same language and you do not get fantastic, creative and effective work. So, you know, we're talk we, we bring in what we call diagonal thinkers. So the diagonal people, thinkers. Diagonal thinkers. You can cut across the brain, left to right, flip between two very easily, translate maths to English and English to maths, and have the ability to make that creative leap from between content and data. Um, and that's a different skill set often than you'll get in a data company or you'll get in a creative content company. Right. And, and Jim, how, how is that affecting uh, your organization, your much expanded organization? Yeah, uh, so I mean, it's the investment in training, in learning and development. And, you know, the amount of attention and investment that we've made over the last several years of making sure that pure media sellers understand the technology mm -hmm. side of the business and vice versa. Um, it's also, you know, the ability to work within an environment where you know that you are not going to know everything, everything. Mm -hmm. and you've got to be able to... Although I still meet some people who honestly <laughs> believe they do. <laughs> but you've got to be able to work in an environment where you're comfortable turning over the sale to the te technical mm -hmm. expert um, and allowing that person to lead the conversation. And that's a difficult thing for a, a pure salesperson to do is to kind of let go of the relationship at certain times. So, you know, there's a lot of coaching that we need to do and a lot of it too is very structural in, in terms of how are you organized, how are you incenting the teams around solving the client issue and not solving AOL structural issues. For sure. So. Well, Jim Norton, Richard Hartel, thank you so much for joining us thank this you. morning and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.